Hi, everybody. This is Matthew Pose of Pose Acoustics, and I'm answering questions. So Daniel Compton from, I think it's New Zealand, who gave 25 New Zealand dollars um, on the sound wave, uh, sound waveforming, unlocking its secrets, asked a really good question. With the introduction of Trinol's waveforming, could you talk more about what opportunities this opens up for your home theater designs? I'm thinking particularly about constraints around acoustic treatment and seating placement. Could you now put seating at the half room length modal point? The answer is yes. This is one of the things I have people ask me all the time, like, do you calculate room ratios? Do you put in base traps? Do you um, place the seats in particular locations? And the answer is, of course, we look at all these things. And I'm probably going to continue to look at these things until we have a lot more um, data in the database, if you will, about how everything works out. But waveforming has a miraculous ability. It's not really miraculous because we do fully understand the science behind it. But for those who are not used to seeing that effect, it feels miraculous to be able to take a room and have things be where they shouldn't be. And then you take microphones and you stick them all around. And all of a sudden you see like a dB or two difference between huge spans of space in the room. So typically, if you were to take a room like mine without waveforming of any kind, and you were to fully optimize four subs in the corner, and you were to take a microphone and you were to put it in this seat, and you were to put it in these two seats next to it, you would find that there is some difference between them, probably plus or minus around 2 or 3 dB with a fully optimized system. But without that, you'd probably be looking at plus or minus 5 or 6 dB or worse. If we then go to the back seats and we do the same thing, you would find the same variation across those seats, maybe a little bit worse. But if you looked at those rear seats versus these, these front seats, because the rear seats are so close to the wall, you're going to find that the base levels back there are substantially higher. So what's going to happen is you're going to find that, and this is exactly what happened in my room, there's like a 6 to 10 dB difference between this row and that row in, a difference, in addition to all the variance between that. When you do a variance analysis of the whole listening area, all six seats, you find that you're probably easily at plus or minus 9 dB across the board. So that's crazy, right? That's like really substantial. And even like fully optimizing it, we'd be lucky to do much better than plus or minus 6 dB across all those seats with those rear seats being so close to the wall. They're kind of like useless seats at that point because of that problem. Well, throw in waveforming, and all of a sudden, there's no real difference. It's, it's just a couple of dB. I mean, I've seen systems that are not set up all that well achieve with waveforming plus or minus 3 dB. That's actually what my, my waveforming is not set up fully correctly. I'm getting plus or minus 3 dB in my setup. Um, and I saw on Shane Lee's system... He's like plus or minus, he's under 2 dB variance at this point. He's like plus or minus 1.75 dB or something like that. And his subwoofers are also not in the correct locations. He's got four in the corners plus one in the middle front and one in the middle back. And he's achieving results that are that good. And he even sent me the most optimal setting combination for what he had looking at it. And I'll, I'll let him show his own data, but basically like the differences were minuscule between his rows of seats. Um, he, he looked at the RSP front versus back, and I'm sure if he looks at all the seats, it's probably relatively minimal, and he's still not set up optimally. I mean, that is really impressive. So with that being true, it suddenly changes the calculus and how we design rooms. Now we really don't need to worry as much about the room's dimensions and the placement of the seats because waveforming is going to take care of the base unevenness problem. Now, it does affect decay, and not everybody likes that. There's been a number of people who have spoken out against the sound quality that they hear from waveforming. I will say this. If what you heard for waveforming was at the Trinov demo at Cedia or ISE, keep in mind that is like one of the worst possible ways to hear the effects because you're talking about they, they do the best job they possibly can. It's an excellent speaker system stuck into a room that they assemble in a couple of days on the show floor. But like, it's not like that room is built like a normal room's walls are. It's not like they've spent hours and hours and hours fully optimizing that system on site with tons of listening tests. They, they do their best and they do. I love the way they do it because Peter Eilat really pushes that they need to set the room up in their facility in Italy, tune it there, and then tear it down and reset it up. That way they don't have to waste time on the show floor to do it. But it doesn't change the fact that things have changed. The response may not be exactly the way it is. And there's still limits in time to get it to sound exactly the way it needs to. Um, and so a properly optimized system in a room is going to have a number of benefits, including the wall construction is more realistic to what a real room's wall construction is like. The noise floor is reduced in the room. 
more time can be spent potentially optimizing everything to be perfect. And so I wouldn't leave that to be your final judgment. Um, the other part of it is that they're trying to show off what the system can do, including its ability to quicken the decay time a lot. You may not like that. Not everybody likes the sound of that. And so you may find that for you to optimize the sound, you'd want to reduce the amount of decay control that it's doing and get longer decay times. There's even an argument to be made for trying to get the decay time to match the decay time of the room at the transition point between between where waveforming is working and where the natural room acoustics are performing. And doing that may require some adjustments to make everything sound good. They actually talked about that in some of their early uh, uh, presentations on it. So what I'll say is, yes, it changes things. It changes the need for bass traps that work down below 100 hertz. It changes, uh, that doesn't mean we don't need them at all. It doesn't mean that they're not worth having to a point, but it changes how important they are and it allows us to make different decisions. It changes where seats can go. It can change the, it changes the consistency between the seats that we're likely to be able to achieve, allowing us to have a lot more good seats. With waveforming, so RP22 talks about needing to predict ahead of time a certain amount of evenness between the seats um, at low frequencies and at like mid high frequencies. And you get a level based on how minimal that is. Well, waveforming is going to make it so that at low frequencies, at least, the dB variation between seats, the seats is going to be minimized to the point that like every seat could be a level four seat and you can easily achieve level four base evenness and base extension. Not waveforming isn't going to enhance base extension outside of its ability to fully optimize a large cluster of subwoofers together. Um, but like because you could then you're going to have more subwoofers than normal, you're going to have a minimum of four but you very well may have five or six or 12 or whatever. So that increased number of subwoofers gives you more dynamic range and it gives you more dynamic range to play with for extending the bass. Excuse me, especially if they're sealed subs. I mean, guys, I'm getting down to six hertz in my room at this point. That's like the, my, the, my minus three dB point is six hertz. It's ridiculously low. And a lot of that is coming from the fact that I've got four sealed 18 inch subs and four sealed 12 inch subs that are being used collectively below 30 hertz. And that gives me a ton of headroom to extend that really low base. So I'm able to do that and achieve really high output. Waveforming in and of itself isn't what's doing that. It's the large number of subs. But had it not been for waveforming, I wouldn't have been able to fully optimize it the way I have. And I probably would have had so many subs. So um, yes, it changes things, I think quite a bit. And I think that the more these systems advance and get better and better, and the more they can do up higher you know, beyond 80 or 100 hertz, the more it's going to continue to change our calculus. The thing that remains is that it's not a miracle worker in the sense that you can't just turn it on. I mean, I need to probably do a video on this alone. You can't just turn it on, set it up, <clears throat> and run and hope for good things. For one thing, we have found that there sometimes is significant differences between the predicted results and the actual results. Usually it means something went wrong or wasn't done right, but that's we have seen that. We have also found for some odd reason that some of the setting combinations, it will show a good predicted result, but the actual result isn't very good. But using the exact same calibration data, a different combination of things like the limiters on the filters and, and the decay control. So different combinations of that will actually yield a really, really good result. So I don't know why. That's probably one of those things that is going to have to be explored over time. And as they figure out what's going on... <clears throat> They'll, they'll be able to improve that in the algorithm. But as it stands, when you set it up, you do need to do, I think, confirmation measurements afterwards, and you need to look at different setting combinations to figure out which one gives you the best results measurement-wise. But then, of course, listen, because there may be one that doesn't measure quite as well, but realistically isn't bad and sounds better. So you want to play with those two things. Then the other thing that we've been finding is that the measurement positions are really critical. And like Shane Lee, I'm going to pick on him again, so the, the like within 48 hours of them releasing to the public waveforming, he had gone ahead and tested it. And what he did was six measurements, one in each seat at the same height, which is not how you're supposed to do it. And he was talking to me about it in sort of general terms, didn't tell me what he thought it sounded like. And I said, well, let's see your data. And I showed him how to go in and look at the data that it reports itself. And it looked awful. And I also saw that it listed only six measurements, actually only listed one, but then he told me why. And I said, oh, no, 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 you're not supposed to do it that way. So I explained to him that one of the new things away for me that's changed is you now have subwoofer-only measurements and you have full 
range measurements that it could all average together and that you really only probably need to do, you could do six, but like three or four measurements that are all the speakers and then everything else should be symbol for only. So he, I don't know what he did for the total number of everything. Maybe he stuck with six, but I think he went down to three or four. And then he did a whole bunch. Like in my room, there's 20, I forget the number I told him, like 26 maybe uh, total measurements, most of which, only three of which are averaged out. The rest are simple for only. And I think he did something kind of like that as well after my suggestions. But the key is that you need to have enough measurements that covers all the seats, some areas around the seats, including in front of the front row, and if your seats are pretty far from the back wall, as long as it's more than a meter from the back wall, you may have some behind the seats as well. And then different heights. It's really important that you have two different heights. Um, and I could see in some spaces you might even need three different heights. So some variation in elevation and a large sampling of the room is critical to getting good results. And so one of the things that's going to come out from waveforming is that it changes the calculus of how we design rooms. It changes a lot of things. But the, the I actually think that the calibrations are going to be just as hard or harder than they were before because we just need so many more measurements. And as I said, sometimes you'll get weird results and you just got to start over. So I hope that's helpful. For those of you that are playing with waveforming, please heed those warnings about um, doing things the way the, the uh, instructions tell you to. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me because I really would like to see people get to experience this correctly. Uh, as I said, I've seen a number of systems already that were set up incorrectly due to a misunderstanding. And I see people sometimes saying, oh, it sounds amazing. And I look at the results and I'm like, I, I don't know what you're hearing, but it's not performing correctly at all. Um, one system in particular I saw, the guy had like no low bass at all. He had set it up wrong and was touting how great it sounded and how the bass decay was like really, really tight and clean. And I'm like, yes, because you have no bass. Um, and he needed to go back and remeasure it. His, one, his problem was <clears throat> nowhere near enough measurement points and then not doing the settings correctly. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Well, thank you again for the donation. Please like and subscribe. That really helps. And keep these questions coming. I've got more, more videos I'm doing.